Hello, I'm here with Caitlin to talk about the bosonic correlated insulator. But before that, we got LCD TVs. Right. So apparently Tom's Guide is, and someone at Tom's Guide named Nick Pino is claiming that um, LCDs are coming to an end, as in LCD displays that you're likely using. Like right now I have three LCD displays in front of me. And they were great. And modern LCDs are just absolutely fantastic. Um, I really like them because they don't deal, they don't really have burn-in issues like the other types of, of televisions. Uh, but unfortunately, it looks like their days are numbered. Uh, so let me share the article here. So this is, like I said, on Tom's Guide. Basically what's happening is that the researchers, the researchers who focus on TV technologies, such as those at Samsung, have decided that they are no longer going to invest resources into researching new LCD technologies. Instead, newer technologies and new research will be going into LEDs uh, type uh, monitors. So OLEDs, uh, mini LEDs, that kind of stuff. Um, so it looks like you're, you'll be sort of forced in the future to upgrade to LED uh, style TVs. Um, I mean, there, you'll still be able to find LCDs, like cheap LCDs, uh, but they're, you know, this is it. This is the end of the line. We're th these are as, as good as they're going to get. So what is the advantage of LED? Less power? Is it brighter? It is. It is brighter. It supposedly has better dark levels. Oh, okay. Um, so if you have, and, and it's emissive. So OLEDs, for example, um, will uh, shine like an old CRT. So the way LCDs work is that there's a layer of liquid crystals that basically align <laughs> uh based to you know block light or let light through essentially and so there's a white light behind it exactly there's a white light behind it. so it, it oh. essentially blocks light so they're filtering okay. okay so so that means that there's always light behind it and you can't block 100 percent of that light so there's always a little bit of light leakage um but led tvs and oled tvs work like the old um crts yes. where the individual pixels actually light up themselves. Uh, so you can get these really rich darks and some very, you know, bright pixels. Uh, historically, they have had issues with burn-in, but that is supposedly getting a lot better. Uh, so you can start using OLEDs with computer monitors now and TVs. Okay. And, I'm and I'm sure the fact that they have burn-in and the fact that you have to upgrade your, you'll probably have to replace your TV. They, oh, after they have burn-in means that they gradually wear out the shiny yes. bits. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. Well, that's annoying. Yeah. Up so I'm screen shavers again. Right. So, well, we'll see. Well, I mean, that may be a feature that the manufacturers are very much hoping for that you'll have to replace your TV. Your, Cause right now I have LCDs that I picked up off the street years ago that are perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, like they'll just last forever. Um, mm -hmm. OLEDs, all these emissive technologies, don't necessarily last forever, although I don't have the stats. Um, they're they're not terrible, but you know that may be a feature. I'm, you know. Yeah, I remember I remember hearing that happened to the first maker of light bulbs. They made light bulbs with a carbon filament that would burn for fifty years, so everybody bought one, and then the company went broke because there was no yeah. reason to ever buy another. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, hopefully, um, yeah, well, but yeah, it's looking like the end for for LCD. Okay, it was a good run. I liked I liked LCD as a technology in the beginning i hated it because if people remember the old original game boy that's how lcds used to always look where the screen refresh was really slow and it. yeah yeah and it was black and white and it well, was they terrible could be brighter. you know i find it's not bright enough which is a thing when you get older your eyes get right. dim and brighter lights are better and these things aren't really bright enough for me right oleds are definitely brighter and definitely do produce a better image so good well i'll probably get one anyway uh all right. Well, I was very charmed to read this article, uh, Data Falsification, Cluster Fake, um, and because it reminds me of something I did before. If you use Microsoft Office, I used to teach Microsoft Office like 20 years or more ago, and Microsoft Office keeps a lot of internal metadata about everything you're doing. So students would try to cheat, and I would always catch them because the metadata records this document was copied from this other document that was owned by this person on that date. So I could say, you just copied somebody else's homework and changed it, and I can prove it. And 
what this guy did is found research. This person did, um, I think, psychological research claiming that people that agree to uh, be honest at the top of a form are more likely to live up to it than people who agree to be honest at the bottom of a form when you set up a situation where they can earn some money and then they have to fill out a form to pay taxes on it. And he found that the da original data was an Excel spreadsheet. And by looking at the metadata, Excel spreadsheets have a formula history XML document included, which records all the original formulas in the cell and all the changes in the cell. They can show they had the row of data. Then they took the eight data points that were most extreme and moved them around into the other group to create the correlation. So we can totally reproduce like, like chapter and verse, step by step, how this data was falsified and proves this is the fourth absolutely proven false um, paper by the same researcher who is now mysteriously removed from their prestigious academic position and their papers are being retracted by the journals and all that. There's an incredible amount of fraudulent science out there. I'm reading so many articles like this, and I remember hitting the same thing, uh, what, 30 years ago when I was doing um, human vision research and the huge scandal was David Baltimore, I, I, I think might be a Nobel Prize, leading a huge field of cancer research and all that stuff had been faked for like 10 years before anybody realized one of his students published incredibly influential faked medical research, which started hundreds of imitation studies trying to reproduce and build on it. And it took like a decade of the world to prove that the original research was just fake. So it really is bad when scientists lie and it really happens a lot. Anyway, the Excel metadata is there to track down. If you're misusing Microsoft Office, you are gonna get in trouble. Anyway, uh, you've got Black Mirror. Yeah, so in today's uh, apocalyptic uh, hellscape uh, that we are moving towards more and more, there are robots now patrolling Singapore airports. <laughs> um, do they have death rays? That's what I want to know. <laughs> this is, I mean, they, the, the, the thing is, it's not, they, they're not even cool robots with death rays. They, they don't have like exoskeletons, although they are you know, made of metal, which is, plus one for them looks kind of like a lego robot yeah yeah i mean it's not that interesting so um the article is from cnn and it's by heather chen and the title is like something out of black mirror police robots go on patrol at singapore airport and i've seen these around san francisco and a few mall robots that go around and they're they're basically walk or i should say rolling um, saw, security saw, cameras like, like trash yeah. cans like daleks without the plunger Exactly. They, they're they're just trash cans. They're they're rolling security cameras uh, that just sort of patrol. Um, Does that have arms or anything? No arms. You can see in the picture here. There's no oh, arms. Okay. So it just uh, takes pictures, I guess. It takes pictures. It can sort of corral people. Like if there's like a fight that breaks out, it can sound the alarm and get people away and tell people to move away until you know backup arrives and stuff. Okay. Um, but yeah, these these don't even have death rays. Can't kill anyone. I mean, this is a pretty boring dystopian. Maybe it feature. could run over your foot. I don't know. Yeah, Maybe. I remember the other thing they people would just tip them into fountains and stuff. Yeah, there's that too. I mean, I would I would be very tempted to to go over the the robot with a uh, like RF probe. Um, oh yeah, you know, see see how it's sending back data. It does seem like a. Uh, reasonable thing to do i guess i mean it can wander around and do what a mall cop can do it can like record what's happening and tell you to knock it off i guess yeah i mean it's like I'm not I said, sure it's, it's, it's a it's a camera on a you know mobile platform but what's the point is it cheaper than a mall cop is it better in some way i don't know i don't know how much you have to pay a guy to walk around it seems i'm not quite sure how this benefits anybody unless maybe one Guy in a booth can really run 10 of them at a time or something. Maybe. I don't know. All right. Sam, your audio is cut out. You are muted. Oh, thank you. Pardon me. Okay, good. Well, then you were answering my questions as if you were hearing them. <laughs> huh. Did it just mute now? No. No. You've been muted for a while, so I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, I've, I was trying to figure out why anybody would hire those police robots, and you were answering my questions as if they were, you could hear them. Anyway, uh, okay. so uh, so there's an article saying 100,000 chat GPT accounts have been stolen, and they've stolen them with the usual kind of phishing. They send them some kind of message, 
uh, by email and get them to click on something and log in and to get their credentials. And the question is, why would you want that? And now it finally explains something I've wondered about for a while. There've been warnings that you should not use these public chat GBTs for company data. And now I understand why, because it keeps your history, which I noticed when I was using it yesterday. It keeps all your old chat history there. I don't know why. As a matter of fact, that seems like a really bad idea. But that means if somebody could log in as you to say BARD or OpenAI, they could see your previous questions and your previous answers. And therefore, if you're it's like an email account. If you're posting confidential data up there, somebody can get it. Now, apparently, you can turn off that history feature, which I would probably like to do. I don't have any use for it. But um, that's why it's valuable to steal these credentials. The only other value I can see is that if you get paid accounts at OpenAI, you get more API calls or something. But, but that's not the issue. They're stealing them in order to go in and steal the confidential data they're sending up to these AIs, which everybody is doing. So uh, that was a risk I understand better. And the other risk I don't understand that well, Google has warned its employees to not use code generated by BARD, which is a bad public relation move since they are also widely advertising, you can generate your code with BARD, it'll be great. Use our product, but we are not going to use that garbage. And they don't say exactly what the problem is, although... In my experience, I don't get any working code from any of these things for what I try. So the code is full of bugs, that's for sure. But uh, they don't explain why very well. Anyway, uh, those are a few minor security issues with LLMs. And uh, let's talk about your planetary systems, which I thought this was very fun. Yeah. Uh, so in school, we learned that the way solar systems develop is you have a accretion disk and the heavier metals sort of fall in closer to the star and you get the rocky inner planets and then the lighter hydrogen and helium form the uh, stay in the outside and they form the the gas giants on the outside now that was because we had a sample learn, size of one yeah i didn't learn any of that when yes. i learned this you know a couple centuries before you they said we really have not the slightest clue how planets form <laughs> Right. So so we had a sample size of basically one. Um, and, and for a while we had, you know, rare instances of exoplanets that were very extreme, like a giant red giant orbiting right next to the star. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, th that's that's that was the story. And it turns out that, no, we are in a very unusual uh, solar system. Most solar systems do not form this way. So there's an article on uh, Scientific American written by Lee Billings. And in the title is, We Live in the Rarest Type of Planetary System. Basically, what they found is that there are four types of planetary systems. The most common is called similar. This is where you have planets that are all roughly the same size, all orbiting their, their star. Then you have mixed systems, which are less common, where you have maybe rocky planets next to gas giants, followed by more rocky planets, another gas giant, so on and so forth. So it's very mixed. Then you have anti-ordered, which I, I object to these terms, by the way. I think anti-ordered should be ordered because you have the, the giant star followed by uh, smaller and smaller planets. This makes sense. This should be ordered. This should be ordered. I don't know. Scientists are terrible at naming things. And then you have, um, but they but the scientists called this anti-ordered. <laughs> and they call um, our solar system ordered, where it has this big giant star followed by smaller rocky planets, followed by larger uh, gas giants further out. Mm -hmm. And that is supposedly the least common type of solar system, and it could potentially somewhat explain the Fermi paradox if an ordered solar system is somewhat necessary for uh, developing uh, life in the solar system. Yes. There are quite a few special things about the uh, the solar system um yeah and that's one i agree i've always thought that was the most likely explanation that our solar system is really very special and it's not true that life could have evolved on so many of those other ones we see out there right right so anyway that's it so everything you knew about planetary formation is wrong that's all yeah well, i never knew anything in the first place ha ha so oh, there you go yeah. yeah all right and uh i've got a few dense physics articles that caught my eye the first one i thought was very interesting um, talking about self-locking oscillators. I think I might have heard of this 50 years ago, but I forgot. There's a thing, Huygens, 
um, in the 17th century, found a property. He was trying to make pendulum clocks, and he wanted to make a bunch of pendulums that would all have the same period. And he found out it's very hard to make them have the same period. But if you hang two pendulums from the same bar of wood, they will synchronize. And that's an interesting effect. And it's how phase locked loops work in electronics. And the point is, if you have two pendulums and they're not equal, then the bar of wood they're connected to will exchange energy from one to the other. And the energy flow will continue until it stops when the two are perfectly locked. So they're symmetrical. So the energy does not flow back and forth anymore. And the same thing happens to light sources, lasers. If there are two of them separated uh, by a certain amount of frequency and they're connected by an optomechanical cavity, then they will also phase lock these two laser impulses. And they think they can use this to improve the light used in quantum computers. So it's a very cute principle and uh, may help deal with things like noise in quantum computers or some, some, far, some application in quantum computers. And the last one, which I thought was a great name and an interesting concept, although no um, applicable, no application has appeared, they discovered a new state of matter. You know, there's solid, liquid, and gas, and then there's plasma, and then there are a few more exotic states of matter, and this is the newest one, um, called a bosonic correlated insulator. And what happens is you take a, a layer of material, which is tungsten diselenide, and you put a layer of tungsten disulfide on top of it, and you rotate one by just a degree or two. So it is slightly misaligned, and this creates a moiré pattern which you take a, a screen or any kind of grid and rotate one on top of another, you get an interesting pattern. And when you do that, the result is you have electrons loose on one side and corresponding holes with a positive charge on the other side. And the electron and holes are drawn to each other and form a combined effective particle called a, not a soliton, but something like a, um, a fermion. Well, it's not a fermion. There's, they call this thing... Uh, Ah, this combined particle. Um, if I can find the name, there's so give some name for this electron hole pair, uh, which I cannot find the name of it anymore. Two fermions, an exciton. They call it an exciton. And those things are now bosons, which means they can all condense down to the same state and share it. And they're able to use lasers to pump them into this state. So the stuff that started out as a conductor turns into an insulator because all the um, excitons are bound together into the same state and they're all locked together and they can't move. So it's a weird kind of structure where you have locked all the charge carrying elements in a quantum mechanical state that doesn't allow current to flow. And this seems, nobody knows what you can do with this yet, but it is a new state of matter and it seems like you could use it to make a new kind of transistor or uh, a variety of other interesting materials. You have a strange electronic um, property you can turn on and off with laser lights so there could be a variety of applications for this strange stuff so anyway a new state of matter to play with and uh all right i think that's it for this one i'll have another one on friday excellent